What kuf noe la du, Chris Nyongets, Aqua Honi Wagito Loda, Okale, Oniata Aga, Nwagatahon Choda. So I said in my language, the United language, I extend my greetings, love, and thankfulness to all of you. I am Chris Cornelius of the Wolf Clan, and People of the Standing Stone is the earth that I come from. Um, I want to thank Tina for the uh, invitation to uh, speak here uh, to you and then um, to share the work. Um, so, how I'm going to kind of start the um, talk is really to give a kind of framework for how um, I see architecture for indigenous people and then how, uh, how that applies to the work, the work that I do and I kind of frame it in, uh, in, in through both lenses, meaning the sort of non-indigenous lens, which is how I was educated in, in architecture, and then um, the indigenous lens. So as architecture students, we uh, early history um, uh, courses, we look at the uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown book um, about uh, learning from Las Vegas. And in the, in the book, they talk about how the, the role of signage in, in architecture in particular. So sometimes the architecture is the sign, which is like the duck, uh, or their signage is applied to the architecture, which is the decorated shed. So when I started my uh, graduate study at the University of Virginia um, and I did my thesis work, I um, really was looking at how architecture was being made for Native clients at, at the end of the 20th century. And for me, it kind of fell into two types of categories, uh, the buildings that were being done. Uh, one was what I call the zoomorph, the buildings that look like animals. Uh, this is an elementary school. This is actually the elementary school on my reservation where I came from. Um, I didn't attend that school. That school was built in, in the 90s, but uh, it's a turtle. Uh, it, everything about it is a turtle. The gym is in the head. Uh, uh, it has eyes on the exterior of it, his feet and tail and everything else. But once you get inside it, you don't know that you're inside a turtle. It's just like any other sort of uh, building that has our sort of radial um, layout. So there are a number of buildings like this. There are other turtles, there's bears, there's thunderbirds, there's other sorts of animals that, that, that um, occur across, across the U.S. And, and Canada. The second was what I call the pictograph, which is um, the, a building that is a normal sort of building, but uh, native iconography is applied to it. That doesn't necessarily make it native. Uh, that applying that iconography, the patterns uh, from, from traditional arts or other sorts of cultural sources doesn't necessarily make the, the building itself cultural. So I saw the association between these things, right, the duck and the decorated shed, because the ways it, that architecture was being done for indigenous people was being done in this, in this kind of manner still kind of is, but for me that was a critique. That was a critique of the thing that I didn't want to do. I, did, I thought there had to be some better way to do things for uh, indigenous people. Um, so a second thought that I want to kind of share with you that, that helps frame the work is, is how indigenous people see the landscape. And um, throughout North America, but w what I'm really thinking about is the U.S. and Canada, uh, we have very, there's very little cultural difference between um, the indigenous people in the U.S. and indigenous people in Canada. But this landscape in Utah is called Bears Ears. Um, and so these are the languages. There's four different languages of the people that are indigenous to that area. I won't try to pronounce them. Those aren't my languages. But, but they all basically translate into bear's ears. Um, and this is uh, a national park uh, designated by President Obama. But um, when you look at the landscape, you can see the ears, right? This looks like a bear that's partially submerged and only the ears are kind of sticking out of the water kind of thing. So they had stories that go along with the landscape. So when you see the landscape, you, you associate it with these stories. And the stories are really important because they tell you things about the landscape uh, and the things that uh, occurred or may have occurred there. So it creates a larger mythology that ties people to the land. And so that is a thing that I'm uh, trying to kind of culturally um, tie into. And so there are a number of uh, things like this in the landscape. This is just one of the examples uh, that I wanted to show. Because it's for me and for indigenous people, really, it's um, beyond this pareidolia effect. Pareidolia is the, the term for like when you look at a cloud and you see a dog or a dragon or something like that, right? Like you see a thing in it. It's beyond that. It's beyond just seeing a thing. It's, it's, it's tying it into the landscape with the culture's mythology and their um, existence. And then, um, <coughs> excuse me, the last thing I, I want to talk about too is that in architecture school we talk about the origins of architecture and this is the frontispiece from Loger's uh, retelling of, of, of architecture. And so in the image, the woman uh, is uh, uh, 
we're supposed to assume that she's the architect that's created this structure, right? The structure is coming from nature, and the way that this is illustrated is uh, how architecture is tied to nature, and it's seeing uh, nature as, as a resource for architecture. I uh, uh, oppose this with uh, the ways that indigenous people have seen architecture. Architecture and building has always been a part of our culture. It isn't something, however, that we've specifically talked about. Um, like many other parts of our culture, like religion, politics, agriculture, uh, business, those kinds of things, all of those things were part of the culture uh, in a seamless way in a, a series of reciprocities. So architecture was seen as an extension of nature. Uh, building was a, an extension of the culture, and so how those things actually actually come, uh, come together. So for me, the difference here is that on the right, we're seeing nature as a resource for us to, to take and to use uh, to create architecture. So nature is mine. Nature is mine to take as a resource, um, that I can use that thing as a resource to kind of better our environment. And the other is nature is me. I'm related to nature. Um, so in many indigenous cultures, this uh, concept of all my relations, and uh, that is a term that gets uh, uh, translated differently in different cultures, but it's basically saying and stating that we are related. All living things are related. I'm related to the earth, it is my mother. I'm related to the moon, it is my grandmother. I'm related to trees, I'm related to stones, I'm related to everything. And I believe that if we thought about architecture as if we were related to it, we would think about it differently, right? We would think about it in a very responsible manner. Um, and that is true. And everything that we use in building buildings, um, we're related to it. So that's a, a, a big sort of concept for me and the way that I think about, about architecture and making architecture for uh, indigenous people. So I'll start with the, the Indian Community School of Milwaukee um, is a uh, K-4 through 8 private school in Milwaukee that serves indigenous students. Um, there's about 320 uh, indigenous students that attend the school and they all come from metropolitan Milwaukee. Um, so they're from an urban context. Um, very few of them have connections to their home reservations. Um, they, um, so there are 11 tribes in Wisconsin that's a, the primary um, student body, but um, students from uh, all indigenous cultures come to, come to the school. And so when I was uh, asked to be a part of the design team with Antoine Predock, um, he uh, took me and as to become part of the team, and I told him that the indigenous culture is not one that can be delaminated. You can't just like uh, show things in a kind of cause and effect way that it's actually a series of reciprocities. And so how we decided to do this, because we weren't making a project for a single tribe or a single culture, we had to look at cultural values. And we looked at multiple cultural values and we created graphic translations of each of those values. So we ended up with about 30 of them. We um, brainstormed early on in the project. We had probably 80 of them, but we boiled it down to 30 essential ones. So this one is dance, um, and we created a graphic for that. And then th this one is the moon. We, we created a graphic for that. It's about the cycles and reciprocity of the moon. And all of these are intended to overlay with one another. So when we presented them to the community, we printed them on three foot by four foot transparencies. We built a light box and then we talked about each one and we put it on the light box. And we started to show how all of these things were uh, intertwined with one another, how they began to um, uh, have a, a dialogue with, with each other. And so this is a graphic that I created of the building. And in that process, what it did was it, it ch changed the way that we talked about the program of the building. So early on in the project, we all decided that we were going to remove any sort of institutional names that went along with the thing. We were just trying to deinstitutionalize de de the school itself. So we never, ever had ever called the place that they eat the cafeteria. The school's been open going on 11 years. Um, it, it going on 12 years rather, uh, it, no one has ever called it the cafeteria. We called it feast. We don't call the place that you enter the building the lobby. It's community. The theater is drum. The stair that connects the uh, lower school grades to the middle school grades is called earth to sky. So all of those terms was part of, were part of my um, role in the project to sort of embed all of the cultural aspects in the architecture uh, in, in the building itself. And so, um, and then part of my um, 
role too was to name classrooms. So I named classrooms based on the things that they were adjacent to on the site. So on this uh, n northern edge here is close to a wetland. So those classrooms are animals that are in the wetland, turtles, muskrats, those kinds of things, because they show up in the culture in different ways. Some show up in creation stories, some show up in clan structures. But when students go to that classroom, they say they're going to turtle. They don't say Miss So-and-So's room or 126. They say turtle, right? That's my classroom. Some of the, their classrooms are strawberry. Some of them are wolf. Some of them are the moon. Some of them are thunder. Like all of these, uh, all of the classrooms have names that are associated with, with the culture. They teach, uh, currently teach three languages, um, Oneida, Ojibwe, and Menominee. Um, the Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi are the other, there's five sort of cultural groups uh, that are indigenous to Wisconsin or part of the indigenous people of Wisconsin. Um, those two cultures have decided they didn't want to teach their uh, language language in the school so the students can learn um, those three languages if, if, they, if they choose. So this is the, this is the school. Uh, it's about 165,000 square feet. Uh, it's almost a quarter of a mile from the end where the gym is and the, uh, this lower end here. Um, so most of the uh, uh, elementary school grades, the K through uh, five, are on the first floor and then the sixth, seventh, and eighth, the middle school grades are on the second floor. Um, we've always talked about the building as if it were an animal inhabiting the site. So we, um, we think about the, the architecture as, as if it were Im embedding itself into the site um, and, and nestling itself into, into this property. The school itself bought uh, about 200 acres um, and so they um, purchased most of the land that you see in the photo um, so that no one can kind of develop that land. But um, when we uh, laid out the footprint of it, we had our civil engineer come out tape out the sort of footprint and then we actually moved the building a little bit to get around some trees. We took out very few trees. I think we only took out three trees, the two of which needed to be taken out um, because they were dying. Um, and then this one uh, we call the Wisdom Keeper here. Um, there's a sort of uh, land amphitheater that goes around it and it's a kind of storytelling tree. Um, so other another thing that um, we gave a name to was the student entrance. So this is a big ritual every day. Students come into the school and leave the school. Big event uh, every single day, and that's called migration. So this is the, the student entrance, how the students come into the building. Um, the building itself is not only a school, but it's a center of community. Um, people from the community come and use, um, use the school. Elders come and use the school. Uh, they use it for different um, community uh, events and different uh, sort of cultural events in, in the area. Um, they've had conferences, indigenous conferences, uh, other conferences actually in, in the building. This is the second floor uh, where the, the middle school grades are. You can see the tree columns, you'll see in this photo and the, the next one. Um, the trees were harvested from the Menominee Nation of Wisconsin, um, which they are indigenous to most of the state of Wisconsin. Um, and the trees are a really uh, integral part of their culture. Their culture is really embedded in trees. Um, if you look at a satellite photo of Wisconsin, you can see where the Menominee Nation is. It's a rectangle just northwest of Green Bay, if you know where that is. Um, it, it looks like it's photoshopped because they have always sustainably harvested their trees. Um, they, um, the trees there are so dense uh, and so healthy uh, and, and that forest is so rich that they actually um, decided a few years ago to drop the Forest Stewardship Council as a uh, standard because their standards weren't high enough. Um, their standards weren't as high as they were for, for the um, culture. But these trees were taken down with a ceremony. They gave their lives to the school. So we think of them as holding stories. Uh, many of them are over 300 years old. So they hold stories of pre-European contact. Um, and those, those trees are within, uh, within the building uh, and throughout the, the building. They're white pines. Um, so we're looking at community. This is community. And then uh, drum is the theater. Um, the, uh, the, the natural light that comes into the, into the building is really important um, to us and the s views of the, of the site were really important to the clients. They wrote a uh, design goal statement before uh, we started on the project that talked about how they wanted um, those things to, to be important. The connection to nature, they wanted students to be able to see uh, nature through classrooms and, and um, things like that. So this is another space, it's called uh, the Place of Nations. It's really, uh, the room itself is used in different ways. Um, classrooms can go in there, Stu uh, teachers can take students in to kind of counsel them. The entire school deals with discipline very differently than most schools. Um, 
they deal with it through the role of responsibility, right? It's the student's responsibility to correct what they've wronged, and so it's, it's a matter of really counseling students than it is about punishing students. Um, and understanding that a lot of these students are coming from backgrounds that are uh, not so great, right? Their family uh, situations aren't uh, great, so it, it's difficult for them to concentrate in school, and so they really try to um, integrate that into, into the curriculum. So th these are pieces of furniture that I designed for, uh, for this space, and I call it the Four Corners. So it's where in the U.S. where um, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado kind of come together. That's a sacred spot for the people that are indigenous to that area. It's a spot actually where you, if you look, you can see four mountains and how they actually come together. So their cr creation story actually talks about them emerging from that, from that spot. And so the pieces here are individual pieces. Uh, the, the four mountains, this is one. There's one over here three and four, and then these two pieces, this one's called Mesa and that one's called Mound. They all kind of nest, um, so that, and they also offer different seating postures. You can sit on top uh, of the high part. Uh, you can see there's a step there, so that if you sit, you sit and um, face the other way, there's uh, other sorts of postures that you are in. So wherever in the school, too, we, we uh, really thought about that idea that um, there are students of different sizes, um, and the furniture it reflects that. Even the window sizes reflect that. Some of the windows go to the floor, so only like little kids can actually kind of see you out uh, of the building. So we, we really kind of um, thought about, about that. So that was a project that really uh, established my um, uh, practice um, and uh, really helped me uh, explain and um, uh, show how I was thinking about indigenous design um, at, that, at that time. So I want to share with you three larger concepts that kind of frame uh, the work. Um, the first is the, the idea or notion that design is ceremony. To me, it's ceremonial. The, the design aspect of what I do is, is kind of ritualistic in a way. Like, I, uh, I need to be of a good mind to put things into the world, right? If I'm making physical spaces for people, whether they're indigenous or not, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, as, as a designer, I think about it as a ceremony. So the ritual of creating the thing, how I'm creating it, um, thinking about the responsibilities I have as a designer, and how it's made and how it will last or how it will weather are all uh, those kinds of things that the things that I think about. So the Indian Community School um, uh, is the greatest client I've ever had to be honest because they, they, um, they understood everything that I was talking about and they're still a client of mine. So I started my relationship with them 16 and a half years ago um, and I still work for them. Um, so occasionally other projects will come up. This is one of the smaller projects that I did for them. Um, I created a room for changing for the sweat lodge ceremony. So it's basically a space that you just go into to change out of your street clothes into the clothes that you uh, go into the sweat lodge ceremony and then back out when you um, sort of um, come out of that ceremony. Um, because they, people were just like kind of changing in the school or in their car or something like that. So this is um, on, on the campus, um, and I call it Grandfather Stone. The stone itself is actually part of the, the ceremony because this, it's the stones that retain the heat um, in, uh, for the fire that, that creates the, uh, the ritual of the sweat lodge. I wanted to make something that looked geological, that looked like uh, something that was uh, already uh, on the site, and so I was inspired by these large stones that were uh, excavated during the process of uh, building the, the school. Um, so this one in particular, the faceted sort of form of it is, is what inspires the form of that. And I began to think about this idea or notion that if you took a stone and rolled it around on the ground, you could make the surface of the thing continuous, right? The surface of the entire stone is continuous. So that's the thing that sort of guided um, the forms that I was making, uh, if I made them out of paper, that, that had to be one piece of paper. Like it couldn't be multiple pieces of paper. Um, and so that is the model of that. I actually gave the model to uh, the carpenters that framed, uh, framed the piece and they kind of put it together to understand how uh, the geometry of the thing worked. And then there's a um, sort of sketch that I did um, on uh, the project early on. So the drawing part of what I do is, is important and I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Another project that I did, this was a completely um, self-initiated project when I didn't have a lot of commission work. Um, I began to think about what if we had architecture where we weren't quite sure who the architects were or the builders. Are they, are they human? Are they animals? Are they some other sort of uh, phenomena that we don't really kind of know about? But whatever they are, they have this sort of tacit understanding of nature. And so I made these kind of temporary dwellings out of um, usually metals, uh, brass, bronze, copper mesh, brass mesh, um, 
um, all kind of soldered together. So part of it was I was exploring these kinds of materials and making models. The other was what if I started to design completely in a model, um, meaning like these are three-dimensional sketches, so I'm not, I don't have, uh, for some of them I don't have drawings that uh, lead to the model. Uh, in architecture, we're always kind of like, the drawings we do, the models we make are always representing the thing, right? Like if, if this is the designed object and if it's a building, we always think about the building and then we represent that, right? I was more interested in what if the, the, the actual thing itself came out of the process of making the representation of it through the drawings or models. Um, and so I built these um, plaster uh, landscapes for each of these and I kind of gave each one a little bit of a um, sort of roll. This one is called the moon scope. It's about uh, viewing the moon. It's built into this old sewing machine base. So I was finding these old boxes and th the old boxes were what I was using for the site, right? The sites are always given to us. So we don't, we can't really change uh, the constraints of that, right? We can't make it bigger. We can't make it smaller. Uh, it is uh, the condition that we are, are given as, as designers. The other thing you'll notice too is that I don't use scale figure people in these. I'm only using animals. Um, and so we're not quite sure. Again, I wanted it to be unclear. I wanted it that to be unclear or ambiguous, um, whether the people were inhabiting these things and using them, building them, um, or if it was animals. Some of them did have drawings, so these are the drawings that led to these other pieces. Um, this particular piece um, uh, will look familiar in a, in a few minutes, but this work, which I was doing around 2009 to 2012, um, I made probably 10 to 12 of these sort of models. Um, they all were uh, explorations of this whole idea, right? I was just kind of giving myself an assignment and a project to kind of uh, do these, these things. So they started to get embedded in my mind, I guess, as a designer, like how I was um, going to start to think about using them um, afterwards uh, once I did have commissioned work. Um, a project that I did uh, last year, 2018, summer of 2018, um, is uh, it was part of a residency in uh, Wisconsin. The, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, there's this literature garden for children um, that's just north of Milwaukee where I'm from. Um, <coughs> I, I received the residency there. And what I did was I wanted to communicate uh, the role of the trickster in native storytelling. Uh, the trickster is something that uses, um, it tells us about our own sort of human um, uh, weaknesses, our, our uh, greed, uh, vanity, those kinds of things are, are part of the, the trickster. And it might be an animal. For most, for most tribes, it's, it's an animal. Uh, and some others, it's some sort of phenomena. Um, this particular piece won uh, the Architects Newspaper Award for uh, Best Temporary uh, installation for that year. And this is, this is the trickster. Um, so it doesn't have program or form. It, it subverts those uh, sort of ideas. Uh, so it's not a pavilion. It's not a thing. I didn't name it a thing. Um, if it, it to kind of pre-subscribe uh, um, how you should use it. What I wanted children to do is to kind of figure out how, what it, what it was, where it came from. Uh, so there's one really great story of a, one, uh, one of the young people that was si vi visiting and saw the thing and they were like, is this an animal? I don't know if an animal made this or people made this or is it part of a movie that I don't know what it's about? Like uh, that was really how um, I wanted um, um, children to kind of think about, about the thing. Um, so for me, when I built the thing too, um, I was thinking about, I wasn't, I didn't have a drawing, a model again. I, these things weren't part of how I was building the thing. Um, it's made out of trees that were harvested on site. Um, so I cut the trees down. Um, it's uh, clad primarily in copper mesh. And so it is loosely inspired by this model, which I call bear. Um, so the copper mesh that's on this model is the exact copper mesh that's on the full scale thing. Um, and then the process through which I go through to patina it, to color it, um, is all part of that. And you'll notice on each of these models too, the things that are kind of sticking out. Um, I wasn't quite sure, like when I design these things too, like as an architect, I don't think I always have to be like 100% sure of what everything is in it. Um, I was wondering like, what if the thing could communicate with other things? Well, I don't know if it needs to receive signals from something or it um, uh, could begin to uh, be connected in a larger network that I'm, I'm not quite sure of. The other thing is that what I'm trying to do with this is I call those pieces its regalia. And so I'm looking at indigenous regalia and the use that of that on indigenous wear, right? So those things, the regalia itself is like hyper ornament. It's more than just uh, ornamental or aesthetic. 
Um, it has meanings that um, have multiple meanings. It might be a trophy. It might be uh, something that you were awarded uh, in some way. Uh, but it also might have some connection to animals and other sorts of things. And so I think that architecture can have regalia. I think that architecture can actually have that kind of connection, um, this sort of hyper connection in, uh, in how it works. And so um, this trickster has, <coughs> has regalia on the ends of it, this piece, and then the top pieces, um, you'll notice that, that it has its um, regalia. So this is, on the right is a photo of what I call in a sketch phase when the frame was sort of erected. And this is how I um, put the thing up, basically, by one person. Um, using this sort of um, indigenous technology um, of how teepees are actually made, they're made so that you can, one person can actually erect the entire thing. Uh, and so by loosely tying together three uh, trees, you can basically sort of lift this thing. And then once I had it up, I sort of walked it into uh, its position and then started to attach these other pieces to it. Uh, Spirit of Space, they make films for Stephen Hall, Jeannie Gang, a bunch of sort of world famous architects and they happen to be friends of mine and they made this film. Um, and I didn't tell them how to make the film. They just basically said, Chris, we were going to go s film this thing in the snow and I said, awesome. What I really love about the film is they got the sense of what the trickster is. If you notice in the film, they film it from a distance, almost as if it were an animal that you got too close to, you would scare it. Um, and so they actually revealed things to me about the piece that, that I hadn't thought about um, before. Um, so this summer, 2019, I actually had the opportunity to build a second one. Um, I won the uh, Knoll uh, Fellowship for Established Artists, uh, which uh, is a fellowship for artists in the Milwaukee area. Um, <coughs> and part of that uh, fellowship is a group exhibition at the Haggerty Museum at uh, Marquette University. Uh, in Milwaukee, and so part of that was for me, uh, what I decided was I was going to build another trickster um, it, the, in a similar sort of manner, but I was going to build it in this indoor context. So uh, what happens is the trickster for me becomes a thing or a vehicle character to speak through. Uh, as a designer, I can speak through the thing, and so sometimes it's hard for, I think, me to explain completely and or understand, but I will t tell you that in the process of making the thing, it starts to tell me what it wants to be. Um, so these trees were harvested from the Linden Sculpture Garden north of Milwaukee. Um, so they are about 35 feet tall. Um, so the first day when I come into the install, these trees are laying on the ground and I have to figure out, I have to get them back up the same way I, I built the, the previous one. And I will say that they're very small in diameter. They're only like two and a half, three inches in diameter. But they're super strong and they're super straight. So when you start pushing these things up, gravity starts to take over. And they'll go right over if you don't um, um, hang on to them. So in that way, for me, the thing starts to tell me what shape it wants to be and then how these things um, kind of go together. And so um, the process is basically the same as the previous trickster um, clad in this um, uh, copper mesh that was uh, patinaed before I got on site. And then I did this um, site, I call it a site drawing for the thing um, on the floor to kind of ground the thing. Um, we're not quite sure, again, whether this thing is alien, where it came from. And then the regalia, uh, because it was indoor, I could do a little bit more with the regalia. So there's fur on it, there are these antlers. We're not quite sure whether the antlers, again, are a trophy or the uh, trickster just found these things and, and uh, put them on. Um, th those the, the regalia on this one is a little bit more elaborate. And it is uh, sort of loosely based on, on the model here. So on the model, it might be a little bit hard to see in the projection, but there's this wire that goes around the top. For me, that serves two purposes. The one primary purpose was I didn't like how the metal was coming to an end. So it kind of is a thing that goes around it to help end that. 
as a design sort of feature. The other is, again, this idea or notion that it, what if it's sort of an antennae that this thing um, can uh, receive signals. So for me, it was uh, how can I translate the thing in a model that's about the size of this object to a full-scale thing? Um, and so this trickster has that on it. It has the, all, all of that as, as part, of, uh, part of making the thing. So here's me um, attaching the, the copper mesh to the frame. And when I'm doing this, um, I really have to think about how I seam it. I don't want to call too much attention to how it's fastened to the frame, um, how the pieces actually interact with one another. So for me, it's almost like I'm making a shirt for a giant bear. Like I have to like fold it and seam it in very specific ways and then, and then attach it. Um, it kind of tells me what it, it wants to be. And then the trickster, this is a tag that's on the top of it called, it says you're on indigenous land. Um, in this case, the, the trickster was speaking through me in a way that was thinking about how the role of the trickster is to remind you of such things, right? The, the trickster is on stolen land. The trickster uh, is very happy to be in this museum. Uh, it, it loves the, the idea of having won this award and, and the getting the attention that it, that it got. Um, and so that was uh, installed from June uh, to August of uh, this, this previous year. So um, as mentioned, I won the inaugural Miller Prize as one of five of Miller Prize winners um, in 2017. Um, so for exhibit Columbus in Columbus, Indiana. And then at that time, they ran a little bit different than this previous one. It was a competition, and so there were five sites, there were 10 designers, so we're basically in a head-to-head -head competition on, on each of the sites, and then the sites were assigned to us. Um, so the site that I got was First Christian Church by Eliel Saarinen, uh, and Eero Saarinen, his son, uh, built in 1942, the first modernist church, basically the first modernist church in the U.S., uh, and one of the first modernist buildings in Columbus that sort of started the whole architecture program. But through that competition, what I wanted to do was bring uh, awareness to the people that were indigenous to that land. Like, who was there first, really? Uh, and it's the Miami or the Miamia. And their uh, primary structure, the uh, thing that they dwelled in uh, and built was the wigwam, which is true of most Great Lakes sort of region um, nations. Um, but, uh, but the Miami uh, specifically was the, was the thing that I sort of looked at and, and how these um, structures were created out of these frames <coughs> of trees uh, that were bent over and create this dome and then clad with uh, bark or reed mats. Uh, and in um, researching these things, I, I began to realize like how sort of really sophisticated they are technologically. So they, they're put into the ground in a way that resists the tension of the bending. Um, they had to have a fire within it, right, that, so that the thing wouldn't fill up with smoke. Uh, they understood they had to have a smoke hole and another sort of source of ventilation uh, to get air into the, into the thing. And so um, we uh, did some research on, on the wigwams. And then on the right is a traditional art of ribbon cutting that's done by the Miami people. Uh, it's usually a sort of really intricate pattern uh, of grids that are overlaid with one another. So they cut these ribbons and then sew them back together. And I explained that um, the ways that we should see indigenous traditional art is really a, a reflection of nature. And it's not always a one-to-one -one thing. It doesn't equal one thing, right? So one of the things it might be uh, uh, looking at is like the feathers of an eagle, right? The feathers of an eagle are very different. To, they're shaped in a similar way. The, fa the, tethers, uh, the feathers on the tail are different than the ones on the head, right? Um, they have different purposes. And so um, that was the thing that I um, sort of responded to uh, as well. And so on the site, um, <coughs> the, uh, if you know the um, site in Columbus, Indiana, the church actually occupies an entire city block. And so we were given this area to place the installation. And I decided to put it on that corner, uh, aligning it with a larger geometry, which is actually a golden section uh, geometry that Saarinen used through the entire thing. So when you look at the front of the church, everyone says, why is the cross not in the center of the thing? That's why it's not in the center, is because it's actually in the middle of the uh, sanctuary, and then there's a side aisle on this side, but it aligns with the geometry that he used. And so where I placed it on the site was, was part of uh, that geometry.
dwelling of the Miami people. So I wanted to address the indigenous people of Indiana, particularly this, this area. And I wanted to make a structure that addressed how native people see the world, see nature, see building. So what I, what I tried to do is to look at the original wigwam structure. What are the constituent parts of that? Why did they use those pieces? So it was originally a round sort of structure that they used sapling, wood saplings that they put into the ground and then bent over to create a dome sort of shape and then clad it with mats or bark. So what I tried to do is to look at how those original structures were, were made and then to do that in a contemporary way using modern materials. The structure is steel rebar that was welded together and then the outside is an expanded steel skin that, to allow some transparency. Sometimes it looks very veil-like. Uh, you can see right through it and then different parts of the day when light is on it looks a little bit more opaque. I did read some of Eliel Saarinen's writing and he talks about nature and how architecture can be sympathetic to nature. The trees here make a very dense canopy. With the exception of this one corner, there's a kind of cavity within that canopy. And so that's kind of why the piece actually leans forward a bit. It kind of leans uh, over the walk and, and to tuck it into the trees and to not really disturb any of the, of the site. We built a wood form on scaffolding that was CNC cut, and then we had a company in Indianapolis uh, bend the rebar in the elliptical shapes uh, for the horizontals, uh, and those were welded together. And I had a great crew of guys from Forcia, which is a local company here that volunteered their time. They're excellent craftsmen, excellent workers, so they helped develop a system for putting these rings on, welding the verticals together, and to help put the, the panels on. So, uh, you know, people made this. still making buildings today. So the piece was um there for about two years. It was we installed it in August of 2017, and it was deinstalled uh, at the end of July this year, 2019. Um, and it is uh, what I'm trying to do is to bring awareness to the, the indigenous people, so that uh, not really replicating the form of the wigwam. Right? It wasn't important to me to re replicate that form. It was to sort of bring it into the 21st century to think about uh, the constituent parts of it, the frame and and the cladding, uh, the the ex expanded steel. Uh, cladding, it, I call its feathers, uh, was bare steel, and so it uh, rusted over over that that two years. Um, and uh, the way that it was situated, the top of it is angled to uh, create this sort of solar event that happens on the fall equinox, which would be a time that it was uh, in place. And so it, it let, lets in the maximum amount of light in on that particular day. Um, so the sun comes through the top and the door. Uh, and then in Columbus, they had like a library storytelling area, uh, time with kids uh, in, in the thing. So the thing's been used for different, different purposes. Um, I didn't really prescribe what it was used for or how it would be um, used. Uh, but I was really kind of compelled by uh, this idea or the image on the left from Nabokov and Easton's book about Native American architecture, how things were tied together and then we're still tying rebar together, right? It, and we're make, when we make buildings today, um, steel rebar is tied by hand um, together. So that was, was part of um, why I used the, the rebar uh, in, in the structure itself. Um, and you see at the top here, it, it also has a regalia, so the orange pieces are part of its regalia. Um, it didn't really sort of trim off the, the rebar, kind of let that extend the, the way that it wanted to extend. Um, and I love this image that the photographer took of, of the two pieces together. Uh, for me, it's, it's the piece and Saarinen having a conversation that we don't cr really understand. They're speaking an architectural language we may not 
uh, be fully privy to, but for me it's a sort of meditative way of thinking about how you exist with this historic uh, building. And then on the left was uh, the spring of, of 2019, so that was it at the sort of peak of when it uh, sort of patinaed. That's the color that I kind of wanted it to come to. And then on the right was during the winter, um, and the thing I love about the image on the right is if you look at the piece and then you look at the trees, it's taking snow in the same way, right? Like it's, it only has snow on, on one side, its sort of skin is still being revealed. Um, and so I have always thought about the piece as an animal uh, that inhabits the site again. Um, it slept at night, There's no, there wasn't any lighting that went uh, with the piece, it was kind of always open. 24-7, um, so um, I was very happy to um, have that uh, piece in Columbus for two years and um, really helped build uh, a lasting relationship with Columbus, Indiana. I really um, love that place and um, I'm really uh, fortunate to be a part of um, the Exhibit Columbus experience. So the second theme of my work that I want to talk about is drawing is medicine. So in Native culture, we talk about things as medicine, meaning it makes me feel better. It's putting good things into the world. So usually it's not just like um, using herbology for medicine. It's like using your activities and rituals for medicine as well. And so drawing for me is that. Um, and so the, the things that I draw sometimes are speculations on ideas. Uh, for me, drawing is really an important part of what I do. I feel like the way that I create ideas is through drawing. I might not always know what the first thing is when I start to draw, but it, ideas do come out if I am drawing. So if I am uh, working, th those things um, do come out. So some of these drawings uh, resulted in some of the models you've seen. Other projects, uh, some of them are like for construction and commissioned work, uh, so there's a mix of details and other sorts of things uh, within them, but they've always been a part of uh, what I do, and I also, when I travel, I sketch a lot, um, and so uh, it's how I see the world, and it's how I get the world to uh, be a part of where I am or, or, or who I am. So that, that idea of drawing came uh, to play into this other project that I kind of gave myself was uh, I wanted to make architecture based on my tribe's moon calendars, but not to make the architecture sort of metaphors for uh, the moons. And so the ca our calendar has uh, different moons, and so usually those moons are named by things that we're doing, uh, planting corn or uh, making maple syrup or hunting or harvesting and storing. Those kinds of things are all part of uh, what we do. And so I created the series of drawings. Each one of them uh, takes the wind data of that particular month and translates it into different forms that are for used for different things. And so this is a little sort of canopy on the top of it. Um, <coughs> and again, as I draw these things, I'm really kind of speculating on who might be using this thing. Uh, I decided to make them all the same, uh, take up the same volume, be displaced from the ground the same amount, uh, have these antennae on the tops of them, and have some sort of canopy and have some sort of way or not to get into them. That, that way might be easy or difficult. In this case, I put this kind of ladder, um, really tall ladder on it. And again, I'm using animals as scale figures, but I'm trying to tie into these other aspects of indigenous architecture uh, throughout, throughout the U.S., not just from, from my tribe, that um, this connection to earth and to sky and, and beginning to pull those things into it. So each of these, this particular drawing won the uh, K-Rob Prize for best physical submission, so for hand drawing. Um, I draw these in layers, uh, so it's this kind of ritualistic way of drawing them. I splash watercolors on them. They're not so like completely precious to me in that, in that way, but I'm, I'm trying to generate ideas. I might write little notes on it. This one I said, I roll out my cloud to make it rain, so the bear is pulling the cloud out. Uh, which is a sort of um, cistern that gathers uh, water. Uh, this one is a thunder moon, so if the thunder happened at night, I need an apparatus to hear that. That's the top of it. Made me think of a deer's ear, and so I put the deer in the drawing. So for me, when I think of things, I put them in the drawing, right? I try not to censor those things too much. I think that as designers, we be can begin to uh, censor or parse these things in different ways before we decide what is, what is um, usable and what is not. And I think we're missing parts of our sort of cognitive uh, system if we, if, we, if we do that too much. This particular image for the Thunder Moon won the best digital image. I think in the sort of 50 plus history of the K-Rob, I might be the only person that's won both hand and digital. Um, 
awards in that in that competition. So in drawing that, I will say uh, in drawing that it also changed the way that I digitally render these things. Um, I wanted these things to uh, use other tools of rendering, not just like always hitting render and save, uh, but to add other things aspects um, to these. And then I started to write stories, uh, short sort of stories about about each one of these. In this one, I made my entrance like a cloud, so the bear doesn't know whether I'm coming or going. I created this sort of maze so he can't get in, um, and so we. Uh, basically every day come to a draw uh, in, in looking at these things. And so I'm also thinking about things like Chaco Canyon, um, which is uh, uh, masonry structures that rival what the Romans were doing. And there's no way they could have seen, known, heard, any, had any contact with the Romans or understood what they were doing. This is in, this is in New Mexico. And so the ways that they're making masonry openings, uh, they figure out how to make a lintel, how to make span things, how to create uh, openings that um, align with the sun and the moon. And so I'm, I'm, when you see the sort of apertures that are made in these, I'm thinking about, about structures um, like this. So the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is decolonizing. Um, and what does that actually mean? So for me, as an activity, design can begin to do that. And um, if we think about how what colonization is, it's, an, it's a system or an apparatus. And that system needs to be dismantled. Um, it, we can't just critique it, uh, protest against it. It has to be dismantled. Um, and so we have to understand the system itself. And so the vocabulary of uh, col colonialism, and I borrow this from Linda Smith's book, Decolonization, um, methodologies. She talks about it in these three sorts of things, and I, I see all three of them as architectural acts. She talks about the first thing is the line. It's uh, usually a map or a survey. So when we find this territory, we're going to survey it so that we can take it, right? So that's what happened in the U.S. The U.S. was surveyed, laid out into states. When uh, Jefferson did the Louisiana Purchase, purchased a good portion of the U.S., the first thing they did was, was survey it, uh, send Lewis and Clark out to kind of do that. So they established the territory. The second thing is to establish the center or the orientation of power. So we're going to put the church in the middle, we're going to put the city hall in the middle, we're going to put the seat of power in the middle of that uh, of that thing. We're es always establishing the center. And the third thing is the, the outside. The, uh, the people are in opposition relation to each other. I'm here, you're there, we're in, you're out. That is all part, and all of that language and uh, rhetoric is all about co colonization. And so if we understand the system, this is how we can begin to design the way that we decolonize it. So we're what I'm trying to do is dis dismantle this sort of terminology uh, so that we can begin to, to think about that. So the image here is a <coughs> the, the United States, might be a little tough to see, but, but it's a triangulation of all of the uh, federally recognized reservations in the U.S., and then the top 50 by population here are um, highlighted. And if you think about this map of the U.S., where people are, some of them are indigenous to this area, but most are pushed to that area, uh, it's in this terra nullius or no man's land. It's hard to farm, hard, it's low irrigation, right? It rarely rains, it's mountainous, it's really difficult to kind of live within. Um, and so this project um, was a speculation on the idea that um, what, I, what I looked what at rather was this uh, American Indian occupation of Alcatraz Island, which happened from November of 69 uh, the 50th anniversary is actually tomorrow, uh, November 20, 1969 is when it started. Um, and it lasted until June of 1971. So several hundred American Indian, uh, mostly students, and other sort of activist groups occupied the island after it was decommissioned as a prison. Uh, the U.S. government put the land into surplus, and they, they basically occupied or took the island based on a treaty that the U.S. government made with the Lakota people in 1870. Um, uh, the Treaty of Fort Laramie. The, in that treaty, it's the U.S. government says any land we deem surplus you can have. And so that's why they took it. And when they took it, they didn't take it for political or financial gain. What they wanted to do was to make it into a native university, native cultural center, uh, native ecological center. And so I wrote this grant proposal that examined the, the occupation because it was interesting to me that they wanted to take it and make architecture, really, th was what they wanted to do. And so in the proposal, I uh, proposed that they got what they wanted. Uh, and the last, this is my supposition, the last thing that President Obama did in office was to give uh, the southern end of Alcatraz Island, which is now a national park, to create a native university for 1,491 students. And so that's what this project is. We are the tribe that they cannot see. We live 
on an industrial reservation. We are the Palusa Nation. We have been called the Indians. We have been called Native Americans. We have been called Hossa. We have been called Pagan. We have been called Delta. We have been called many names. We are the Palusa Nation. We are the human beings. The callers of names cannot see us. So this piece of music is uh, by a group called Tribe Called Red. Uh, they're an indigenous group uh, that take EDM music and mix it with traditional singing and dancing. Uh, they're based in, in Canada, and the person's voice you hear is John Trudeau, who is a native poet, uh, activist. He was actually on the island of Alcatraz, was part of the, um, part of the uh, occupation, and one of the last things he did before he passed away was this, was this particular piece. And so uh, the notion here is that you can begin to see what I'm trying to do is to tie into all of the complexities of why they would occupy the island and why they would want to turn it into this, into this thing. And because that, as a co very complex thing, uh, it, it warranted this kind of drawing for me that was sort of multi-layered and multi-sort uh, of uh, valent in a way to look at different things. And so I created a series of drawings that are themed. This one is about trajectories. And so the one of the first things I do is to draw every edge of every building on it. And then to what are the all of the kinds of trajectories that I can begin to think of that are the uh, air traffic, the water traffic through, um, through the San Francisco Bay around the island, the winds, uh, sun patterns, those kinds of things, but also these notions of other trajectories like tr what I would call the trajectory of death, which is the Trail of Tears. So if you can imagine a map of the U.S. where the Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Oklahoma are, these people were walked, uh, literally walked from their homelands to um, to Oklahoma in the 1800s. Many, many people died in that process, uh, but, but it was a way to kind of take the land that they were indigenous to and put them into this one area which wasn't a state yet, which was uh, Oklahoma. So that's with, within the drawing. This one is called Territories, and so I'm thinking about how different territories are uh, claimed and um, sort of uh, identified and one of the ways that uh, that is done on the island is through graffiti. You saw the Custer had it coming. That's actually a photo of graffiti that's on the island. So if we think about other um, sort of sources of activism, rhetoric is important. Like what things are called and what sort of terms in, uh, pe uh, that our people are using are important to that. And so. Um, uh, the graffiti, I use petroglyphs, um, other sorts of maps of, uh, of settlements, and so I'm uh, proposing that the southern end of the island is where the sort of uh, campus would go. 
This is an outline of Taos Pueblo, so almost the size of a city could go on the, on the a small city could go on that um, sort of piece of land. Underneath that is this idea of land secession, and secession is a fancy word for stolen, uh, but the idea is that, uh, and I use the South Dakota and use Wisconsin as the two examples. One, because this was a huge territory, um, it was called the Great Sioux Territory, which is this outer line, and then the government came in and said, you can't have all of that, you can only have this, uh, and then you can only have this, and then the yellow lines are the federal reservation boundaries. Um, this is the Standing Rock Reservation. This is where the pipeline goes through. Uh, and then Wisconsin, where I'm from, my tribe is indigenous to New York State, but we moved to Wisconsin in the 1820s. And when we moved, we purchased the land with the Menominee people. So when we moved here, we purchased this much of the state. So uh, more than 20 years before it became a state, we purchased that. The federal government shrunk that to this and said you can only have that. So we purchased that. And then in 1838, the federal uh, reservation boundary was established. And then uh, we purchased that. So we are on land that we purchased three times, but we don't own all of it. Uh, we don't own all of it uh, because of the Dawes Allotment Act that happened in the 1890s. Um, which allotted every tribal member 40 acres, but didn't tell them that they had to pay taxes on it. Uh, and so when the tax bill came due, they would um, repossess the land. So that was a structural mechanism used to take the land back, basically. Um, and so it got down to a point where we only owned about 20% of the land. I think we're somewhere in the 30 to 40% uh, uh, of land ownership within, within the reservation boundary today. But in this drawing, there are multiple things. Uh, uh, um, Acoma Pueblo, which is a Pueblo city. And so I think that we need to change the canon of architecture. How we're teaching architecture and architectural history should be changed because there is architecture that is indigenous to the US, right? The first masonry buildings were indigenous buildings. The first multi-story buildings were indigenous buildings. They were pueblos. The first sort of infrastructural systems of plumbing and sewage were indigenous systems. Um, we don't teach that in, in, in history. So the Acoma is a, is a pueblo that, that is one of the first cities in the US. It was settled in a sort of dense way in a similar manner to most of our, our cities. Shaco Canyon is a part of that as well. Again, I talked about how complex of a masonry structure it is. Also the fact that I want to point out that they figured out how to make masonry in circles, right? That wasn't a thing that people were doing uh, at that time. And the people that made it were the Anasazi. And the Anasazi are a culture that completely disappeared. Actually, no one really knows what happened to them. There's no uh, documentation, no history of it. Most people think that they moved away from their dwelling because of a drought and then sort of blended in with the Dine or a Navajo people of the Southwest. But it's really uh, an interesting story because we don't really know um, all of the aspects of the, of the culture and what happened to it. Uh, like I said, I'm indexing petroglyphs. There's a group that goes around and 3D scans the petroglyphs to kind of preserve them and so that those images are in, in the drawing itself. Uh, also, I'm indexing through just text here, 1229-1890. This is uh, the date of the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre. So in South Dakota, this is, so when I hear things like um, Las Vegas was the largest gun violence uh, in the US, that's not actually true. Um, three, over 300 people were massacred at Wounded Knee. And they were massacred by the US government, the US Army. They were unarmed, uh, they were dancing, uh, and because they were dancing, their leader told them to keep dancing. Uh, the bullets won't hurt you if they start shooting, and they shot them. Uh, the people that they shot, of those 300 people, more than 200 were women and children. All of the men were actually out in the field fighting uh, the U.S. Cavalry. Um, this is an image of that day. So we get, this is the end of December in South Dakota. The ground is frozen. And the people were piled into this mass grave. This is the U.S. Army right here. This is our relationship with the U.S. government. The U.S. government is responsible for the largest acts of gun violence in this country against its own people. Now, this is only one incident. There are hundreds of these incidents. If you think about the fact, 1491, indigenous people were 100% of the population of this continent. Now we're like less than 1%. We're barely 1%. So that system of uh, genocide is really what it is, and it needs to be called that. Our government in the US has not used that term. Canadians have only started to use that term. 
Um, but I think, in reality, in order for us to have a true dialogue about this, we have to be truthful about it and what happened. I don't think me and, or any other indigenous person is screaming about this sort of thing and saying, well, we have to go back to think the way that things were. No, we want recognition for this, right? We want, what are the other sorts of ways that we could begin to have this dialogue of having any kind of reconciliation with that in our history. We need this to be taught in our history books. Like this is actually US history and it needs to be taught in, in, in what we're doing. So it's important to me that I index it through this text and not show that image. The only time I ever show the image is when I lecture about it because it's very powerful. And I will say this too about that specific image. One of the biggest problems with the Dakota Access Pipeline is not just because it, it sacrifices the water quality um, of the area. It's because they had an archaeological uh, survey history that was given to them that said people are buried in the ground. Human beings are buried in the ground. This land is sacred because our ancestors are buried within it. And I'm not like, talking ancient ancestors. We're talking about grandparents, like two generations. I'm two generations from that. My grandmother was taken from her parents, put into a school, and forced to speak English. She didn't speak English until she was 13. I have to live with the trauma of that. I have to live with the trauma of why my grandmother would never teach me my language because of that, right? So this is not like ancient history. This is, this is my grandmother. This is two generations from me. Um, we have to be clear about these kinds of things. And that's what I'm trying to do with the drawing is by indexing it through, um, through the text. So the project is ongoing. It's a research project. Um, I'm also interested in how can we make data into form? How can I use it as a designer? And that's, that's really, uh, I, I do that through form. And so those 50 um, reservations, these, this is the population of it. Uh, those are the area, and then that's the density, the sort of function of both of those uh, people per acre. Uh, and I see those things as solid forms, like the thing is an actual thing. Um, and I won't get into all the complexities of this, but I started to create these data animals. I call them data animals because they're like shadow puppets, meaning like we're not so focused on what the hands are doing, we're more focused on what they sort of cast, like what do they start to become. And so the animals started to cast these uh, interesting shadows. I'm also trying to tie into other indigenous things like the Zuni Pueblo. The Zuni people have these things called fetishes, which are really sort of small animals you can hold in your hand. Um, they have a special meaning um, to them. And so um, I make these pieces, uh, they're 3D printed and painted. And so this is in an exhibition I had at the University of uh, Arkansas in January. You can see them on, on the right. And so they, uh, I see them as animals. We're not quite sure, I'm not sure, and I'm not trying to make uh, specific assertions about them being birds or other sorts of animals. Some are black, some are white, just like some things are male, some things are female, some things are predators, some things are prey. Um, that's kind of what, where they kind of come from. And so the project itself is in this stage where um, I'm doing these massing studies, and uh, like I said, the, the university will exist on the southern end of the island, which is mostly not used during the national park part of it and so I'm uh, making the assumption that it would still be a national park people would go visit it but it would have this university for uh, native students on it so what I'm trying to do is to take all of this sort of information and then put it into something positive and through the design right for me the design this idea of the design is ceremony the drawing is medicine uh, and this decolonization are all tied together in a way that uh, I will eventually sort of put into this specific project and the hopes is that I would um, publish this as a, as a sort of um, treatise on how I think about indigenous architecture and tying into these other sort of aspects of, uh, of, the, of the project and of the culture and how it exists in, uh, in the world today. Yeah, welcome. Thank you.